Hello friends and welcome back to another manga reading vlog. I have a whole bunch of first volumes to series that I would like to try out with you. And I actually have a few more on the way, so we're definitely going to be reading five in this video. We may be reading more. But let's talk a little bit about the volumes that I do have here with me that we're going to start on right away. The first is Boys Run the Riot. I am really excited about this series. Partly because, I mean, this cover looks incredible, but also because it is written by a trans mangaka and it is about a trans character. It also seems to be focused on a friendship that develops and also that these two friends are interested in fashion and want to start a fashion brand. So that's sort of a fun plot and setup, I guess. Anyway, I don't know a whole lot about this manga. I think there's four volumes currently available and I think that might be it. I think it might be complete. On the back it says, readers are looking for smart stories about transgender and non-binary characters and the added hook of Japanese street fashion makes this one irresistible. So this is definitely one of the ones that I'm most excited to have discovered. And then we've got A Sign of Affection, which seems like a cute romance kind of setup. Yuki is a college student who's into friends and fashion. She's also deaf. A chance meeting on a train leads to a serious crush, but can it grow into something more? It's only her crush seems like a bit of a globe trotter. He apparently knows quite a lot of different languages and he's just very confident and forward. And he seems interested in learning sign language and learning how to better communicate with Yuki. I haven't had a great track record with like shy girl shoujo sort of romances. I often, I hate the trope of like the shy quiet girl falls in love with the first boy to pay attention to her. I've read that a few too many times in manga and I just, I don't love it. But the characters in this are a little bit older than a lot of the, those sort of stories that I've read. They're not in middle school or high school even, they're in college. And Yuki herself is 19. So I'm hopeful that even though I've heard that this is super cute, super fluffy, I hope that the characters at least come across a little bit more mature. Cause I think I will be more likely to enjoy something like that. I did think it was worth giving it a go anyway. It seems sweet. After the Rain is probably the most controversial pick on this list. And that is because it is about a 17 year old girl who falls in love with her 45 year old manager. So definite big age gap premise here. And it could go either way for me. Obviously we know in the last video that a bride story did not go well for me, but I have heard, I have heard that that age gap is really used as a setup to explore uh, these different characters and their goals and desires in life. That it does not develop into any kind of romantic or sexual relationship, which is key for me. And from what I can tell, the mangaka wanted to set up this uncomfortable premise in order to explore an interesting story. And so I, I am open to seeing how someone tackles something like this, especially when it is a trope that is often used and not done in a sensitive, respectful, healthy way. So I think by the end of this, I will have a pretty good sense of whether this is going to strike the tone that I'm hoping for um, and whether it will be something that I want to invest in and continue. Then we've got a cute little one. It's called, I think our son is gay. Uh, this is a very short manga. And from what I understand, this was actually like published online and it's told from the perspective of a mother who has two sons, I think. One is in like year 10-ish. Um, and she thinks he might be gay. So I think that could be quite a sweet, tender setup of watching someone you love figure themselves out, but giving them space to do that on their own terms. Um, also, you know, with an awareness that society might not always be super accepting of them. Uh, so yeah, I'm just, I'm curious to see where this goes. I've heard it's really cute. And then we've got Blue Flag, which has just, I've seen pop up all over booktube and like people who read manga on YouTube. Um, even Instagram. It just seems like a very popular manga the last couple of years and I don't really know a whole lot about it. I think it's sort of set up as a love triangle but I think also it might subvert that a little bit. So I don't know. I don't really know what to expect with this one but I'm looking forward to finding out more. And just so you know up front uh, I may be talking about what some people might consider spoilers for these volumes. I think it's really difficult to talk about a a manga series without spoiling the first volume. To me, the first volume really is about setting up the series. So I don't consider these spoilers, but I'm just gonna put them out there for those of you who do. But anyway, that's enough of that. Let's get stuck into reading. Okay, I have read three volumes of manga so far. So let's talk about them. I think your son is gay. This is really sweet. This is basically about a boy named Toroki who's just started high school. He has a younger brother named Yuri. Uh, he lives with his parents, although his dad sort of works away quite a lot. However, even though it is mostly about Hiroki, it is told from his mother's perspective. And it's just, it's quite sweet. It's just his mother realizing that some of the things that he says or how he says them or some of his behaviors may indicate that maybe Hiroki is gay. It's pretty light. Like there are elements of like the father 
uh, imposing, I suppose, some elements of toxic masculinity on his sons. Uh, but it's nothing, at least at this stage, that is sort of really, really nasty, horrible stuff. Hiroki's mother, on the other hand, is just kind of adorable. She's sort of noticing these behaviours and these things that he's saying, or, you know, the fact that he's getting a lot of texts from this particular boy and he looks all super excited. But she's never, like, pushing him to come out to her or anything like that. It's more just her noticing these things and going, oh, I wonder if maybe my son's gay. So I really liked it. I think it's really cute. However, I don't think I'm going to be continuing with the series. As much as I enjoyed this, um, as I spoke about in my last manga reading vlog, I've kind of learnt a little bit about the fact that just because you enjoy a first volume doesn't necessarily mean that the entire series is worth your time and investment. And I think for me at least, this is one of those situations. Even though I enjoyed it and I think it's really sweet, already in this very, very, very short volume, it did feel a little bit repetitive. I mean, most of the time, uh, you know, Hiroki accidentally saying boyfriend instead of girlfriend or something like that um, is just played off as the main gag. I think that alone comes up three or four times. But I guess even though the content is completely different, it kind of reminds me of A Man and His Cat in the sense that I just don't know how much more I'm going to get from reading more volumes of this. As much as I enjoyed this first one, I don't think it's going to develop into some really interesting plot. Um, I might be wrong and maybe I'll keep an eye out on reviews and stuff, but um, yeah, I just don't feel any need to continue. I enjoyed this, it was fun, it was sweet, but I'm kind of done. Then A Sign of Affection, which was quite a sweet little romance between Yuki, this 19 year old college girl who is deaf, and Itsumi, who is this young man who's a bit of a globe trotter. he likes to travel, he's learnt several different languages, um, and he's just really confident and quite forward. So when he first meets Yuki, he like uh, immediately tries to communicate with her. I think Yuki's experience is that other people have sometimes maybe just assumed that they can't communicate with her because she's deaf and felt a bit embarrassed and just avoided her. Whereas he's just so forward that he's like, teach me sign language, like, you know, texting her, all of that sort of stuff. One thing I will say that I really appreciate this is just how sensitive and thoughtful the um, mangakas seem to have been. Like there's a whole little interview with them at the back um, and they have a deaf person, I think, who they're sort of like liaising with and um, who are helping them make sure that they're portraying um, the deaf experience in a respectful and like accurate kind of way. Uh, they've also done a lot of research about different kinds of sign language um, and they've done, like they've made it a quite a clear intention to portray that really effectively. And they spoke about how important it was for them to like portray uh, Yuki's actual use of sign language throughout the manga. So even though I quite liked all that and I did quite like Yuki in a lot of ways, I don't think this is one I'm going to continue with either. I think the main thing for me was that I was expecting it to be a little bit more mature, I guess. Because they're in college, I was hoping that the relationship and the characterizations would just feel a little bit more mature. But this reads like, like they could just be in high school or even middle school, like for some of the manga that I've read before. I've read a few manga that basically the trope is that, you know, the quiet shy girl falls in love with the first guy who pays her any attention and is nice to her. <laughs> And this feels a little bit like that to me. It almost feels like Yuki likes him so much because he's paid attention to her and because he's talking to her and because he's nice to her. And other than that, there doesn't seem to be much connection or much interest between them yet. But for a first volume, I certainly wasn't invested. And I suppose I've just, I think it's going to be a bit less mature than I was hoping it would be. And when I say that, I don't just mean like that I wanted it to be more explicit or anything like that. Just in terms of like how they're relating to each other and how they're communicating and stuff like that. It just feels a little bit too immature for what I tend to enjoy in my manga. Much more successfully though, I did also read Boys Run the Riot and I loved this. In this we meet Ro, who is a transgender student at high school uh, and he's just sort of struggling a little bit with, I don't know, just like asserting his his identity, I suppose. He does wear, or he whenever he can, he does his best to wear more masculine clothes. Um, even in the notes, it does explain that he's using masculine like language to describe himself and his experience in Japanese. Um, but when other people pick up on those things, rather than sort of um, affirming himself, he does like drop back into using feminine pronouns and stuff like that, just to 
you know, maybe keep himself feeling safe and make other people feel comfortable. Um, but as the story goes on, a new kid at school, Jin, who is actually a year older than everybody, but he's been kept back at school. He's a bit of a rebel. Um, he starts and he has this grand passion and idea for creating a fashion brand. And he sort of ropes Row into this journey. And it's really great because like Jin doesn't just want to make clothes, for a quick buck. Like he genuinely believes in clothes and fashion's ability to um, help us express ourselves and express our identity and to almost like push back on stereotypes and assumptions that are made on us and our identities. And so Ro very much identifies with that as well and can like participate in that passion with Jin. And their friendship is just gorgeous to watch. Jin is a bit of like a blokey bloke. Uh, he, I don't think he knows a whole lot about transgender issues, but when Ro comes out to him, uh, he's just super respectful. Um, and so just like having this really safe space between the two of them is just really gorgeous to watch. And I love how we have really great trans representation here, but we also have this really interesting story of these two sort of finding a new passion and getting so involved in it, and that is fashion. You know, the journey of figuring out how to set up an online shop and where to source their products from and even um, taking photography of their clothing and stuff like that. But I just am really enjoying this, both for the representation, but also the story and especially the friendship between Ro and Jin. So I loved Boys Run the Riot. I'm definitely continuing this series. It's complete at full volume, so it's not a big time or money sink. I've already ordered volume two. And now I'm gonna get stuck into Blue Flag and After the Rain. So we're back with an update. I read quite a bit more manga. Some of these I really enjoyed. Some of them I feel conflicted about. Others I liked well enough, but I'm not gonna continue. Let's talk about it. So firstly, Blue Flag. Now I know this is a very popular manga at the moment, it has been for the last year or so or two. I don't know actually, but I've just, I've seen it quite a bit fairly recently. Uh, and I can I can see why people like it. So this follows our main character, Tai Chi. Uh, he is sort of just like a regular, fairly quiet, reserved high school boy. He was childhood friends with Toma, uh, who is sort of like the jock cool guy, but they don't have a lot in common anymore and they aren't super close. But Futaba, their classmate, has a big crush on Toma. And she asks Tai Chi to sort of help him I don't know, get closer to Toma. She knows that they were friends when they were younger and so she asks for his help. Anyway, so he agrees to help her, but through sort of them figuring out how they can orchestrate moments for uh, Futaba and Toma to connect and spend time together, Tai Chi and Futaba are spending more and more time together. So around the same time, we start to realize that there are potential feelings between Futaba and Tai Chi. We're also learning that Toma actually has feelings for Tai Chi. So classic love triangle, right? Except, there's more. It's actually more like a love quadrangle. Is that a word? Because Futaba's best friend also admits to Toma that she has feelings for Futaba. So while Taichi and Futaba are getting closer and developing maybe feelings for each other, or there's at least potential there, their best friends already have crushes on them and they just don't know about it. So there's a lot of tension, a lot of angst, but it's also just quite sweet. And all of the friendships and the character dynamics really work for me as well. This sort of high school setting with like a lot of angst and romance, romancy angst doesn't always work for me. Sometimes it's just a little bit too angsty, a little bit too immature, I suppose. Not to say there's anything wrong with that, just for me and my personal preference and I suppose also my age. Whereas even though this has a lot of those elements, it doesn't feel too immature. I think that's the strength of the characters and the characterizations. They feel like whole people and they feel like they're trying to figure themselves out and that process is a bit awkward and uncomfortable. It just makes sense. I like it a lot. So this is one that I want to continue. Now, a very popular manga at the moment, Spy Family. This has such a fun premise. Basically, Twilight, our main character, is like the greatest spy of all time. And his new mission is to infiltrate like a high society school uh, because there's some nefarious stuff going on there. So he's tasked with essentially like finding a kid uh, who he can enroll as his own so he can be like a parent at the school. But he doesn't like working with other people. He doesn't like having to rely on other people. He's very independent. He works solo, but he is committed to this mission. So he goes to an orphanage to adopt a young girl who he can enroll and pretend he's the father of. But it just so happens that she is a telepath. So she knows straight away that he is a spy, but she doesn't let on that she's a telepath because she wants to be adopted and she doesn't want to freak him out. And just to add one more spitter into the works, this school is very conservative and only admits children from like 
heteronormative nuclear families. So he also has to manage to find a wife. And through a series of strange events, he manages to do just that. But it turns out that she is secretly an assassin. So a spy and an assassin are pretending to be married and have an adopted child who they're pretending to pass off as their own, who happens to be a telepath. So it's sort of one of those funny, silly, absurd kind of setups, but it's done really quite well. And I had a lot of fun reading this. However, this reminds me a lot of my experience of reading Astro Lost in Space. And I spoke a little bit about this in my last manga reading vlog. I really like Astro Lost in Space. That first volume was so fun. I really enjoyed the process of reading it, but I was not so invested or interested in the characters or the plot to go out and buy more of the series. And I think at least for now, that is where Spy Family is falling for me. I really enjoyed this first volume. It was super fun, but I don't know that I care so much to invest a whole bunch more money and time into obtaining, collecting, and reading the rest of this series. I may change my mind. Maybe one day I will just be super in the mood for a fun romp. But for now, I just have other things that I'm much more interested in continuing with. The next volume that I finished is After the Rain. Now this one, this one is controversial and there's no way of getting around that. This follows our main character, Akira, who is a 17 year old girl. She was in the track team and she was incredible. She was one of those kids that was just clearly talented and absolutely loved running. But at some point she injured herself quite badly to the extent where, uh, you know, she had to have a lot of downtime with rehab and even surgery. And so she can't be part of the track team anymore. In the meantime, she's working at this sort of family restaurant diner place. And the manager there, his name is Kondo. He's a like a divorced middle-aged guy, sort of like not really going anywhere. Uh, he's perceived by a lot of people as not having much backbone, but Akira has a massive crush on him. At first, because Kondo's confidence is so low, he just sort of brushes it off as a joke or even a prank. But once he starts to realize that she's serious, he gets quite flustered and uncomfortable and uncertain. Now, obviously that age gap and the fact that she's still in school, he's literally her manager, totally inappropriate. But at least from my reading so far of just this first volume, it's quite clear to me that this relationship is not going to work out. There are definitely elements of this that make me uncomfortable. Like the age gap itself makes me uncomfortable. Also Kondo's sort of response to it is not ideal. He doesn't just, you know, shut her down and tell her, no, this is inappropriate. Instead, because he's so insecure in himself, he goes through weird excuses of why they can't be together. You know, what will people think? Why would you like someone like me? I'm pathetic. And he even at one point jokes, if you had one date with me, you'd realize how boring and pathetic I am. And so he ends up sort of backing himself into a corner where he does go on a date with her. And he's quite uncomfortable and nervous and insecure and all of the things. But agreeing to a date, even if he thinks it's going to show her how much she doesn't want to be with him, is inappropriate in and of itself. So I can definitely appreciate why for many people this would just, you know, be a deal breaker. For me though, this at least for now is walking a line that I am finding really compelling. I think it's sitting in that uncomfortability. It's not trying to justify or even romanticize this relationship. Instead, I think it's trying to acknowledge that there are situations similar to this, that they are inappropriate, but also just trying to explore the psychology of the two characters in the situation. For example, Akira has just sort of like lost her love and passion for life because she can't run track. And so it's almost like she's throwing herself at Kondo as a distraction or as a way to try and find some kind of meaning in her life. Whereas for Kondo, he lacks so much confidence and is so insecure and almost directionless in his own life that this beautiful young girl liking him is kind of like a shock to the system. It makes him reflect on and remember his own youth and his own hopes and dreams for his life. And I'm hoping that it's going in the direction that I think it's going. If it turns it into some justified romance, I will be mad. There's no way of getting around that. I did also manage to get the entire series secondhand for a total bargain. So I am going to continue reading this. Akira is a really interesting character to me. Kondo, I don't particularly like or dislike. I mean, I wish he had more backbone and would just sort of put his foot down with Akira. And I suppose the fact that he doesn't feel like some sleazebag who's coming onto her and the fact that this doesn't feel like it's written for young girls to sort of fantasize about or romanticize their crushes on older men. I guess all of that positioning and framing is what is making this uncomfortable 
but interesting to me, as opposed to just off-putting. Akira is just a really strong character right from the beginning. She's sort of one of those quiet, but like really fiercely independent sort of people. And I suppose what I find so interesting is how she feels and looks like a mature young woman. And yet her almost obsession with Kondo and her using him as like this emotional crutch after losing something that matters to her so much is quite an immature thing to do. And I suppose I find that sort of zooming in on that juxtaposition and that awkwardness of that age of being almost an adult, but not quite. I'm finding that really compelling. So yeah, definitely a controversial one, potentially problematic. I hope it's going in the direction I'm thinking it's going in. But seeing as I've got the whole series and I managed to get it for a bargain, I am going to continue with this one. Now for something that's just utterly wholesome. It's Donuts Under a Crescent Moon. This is so sweet. This is the story of Uno and Sato. Uh, they are both working women. They work in an office. And Uno is a little bit younger. Uh, and she is sort of trying to find a husband. She's confused and frustrated about why she just doesn't seem to be able to fall in love. She gets set up on all of these dates. She meets all of these really great men. And she likes them all well enough, but she just never has that feeling, never falls in love with any of them. And she sort of feels like there must be something wrong with her. Meanwhile, Sato is a little bit older. She works in the same office and she doesn't seem to be worried about the fact that she's getting older and doesn't have a husband. They develop a bit of a friendship and start to get a bit closer. And this is just ultimately a very slow burn romance. I've only read this first volume and it's already quite clear that Uno doesn't realize that she might be queer uh, and she's still sort of, even though she has so much affection for and only wants to spend time with Sato, she still sort of hasn't let go of the idea of finding a husband and sort of fulfilling that role she thinks she needs to fulfill. I think Sato does know that she's gay uh, and she's just sort of waiting for Uno to realize it too. But so far they're just developing a really close, sweet connection and it's just adorable. It's adorable. But because they're both in their 20s, it's a little bit more mature and I'm just really enjoying that. So this is definitely one I'm going to continue with. I've already bought volume two. So continuing with three of these series, DNFing one, at least for now. Then I've got two more volumes to get through for this vlog. We've got A Perfect World and Watakoi. I think I'm going to really like Watakoi, but we'll see. This is again, a bit more of an adult romance. Um, a perfect world I feel like could go either way for me. This is a romance featuring disability, which obviously I'm all here for that representation. But I just think with manga, I, I mean any medium really, when people decide to include people with disabilities, um, that representation can go either way. Let's just say that. So this one I am hoping will be great, but we'll just have to wait and see. I'll check back in with you when I finished those two volumes. So I read A Perfect World first and I liked a lot about this. Uh, this is basically about uh, two characters who went to middle school, I think, together um, and she sort of had a crush on him. Um, and now they've sort of re-met uh, in a work situation when they're in their sort of mid-twenties. Um, she's an interior designer, he's an architect. Uh, but he's now in a wheelchair. And this is just about them reconnecting really. Um, and also her learning about what his disability actually means on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think this might be the first manga that I've read featuring prominently character in a wheelchair. And I do think that's really cool and important. And I do think that it's quite clear that the author has taken great care with the representation of disability. And I can't remember where I read it, if it's in the notes of the book or if I read it online, but the author's mother, I think, was disabled. And so she's sort of taken inspiration from her experience of that, as well as interviewing and speaking with disabled people as well to ensure, you know, proper and respectful representation. So even though this is depicting an experience that the author herself does not have, she's clearly uh, taking the responsibility of representing this experience very seriously. And I think in that way, it tackles the subject of disability and just how much it impacts people in a really, really clear, honest and raw sort of way. For example, things like accessibility and just how many barriers to entry there are for people in wheelchairs, for example, and just getting about and how difficult that can be. To even just like the health complications of having a spinal cord injury, such as bed sores and kidney problems. The representation is not perfect, however. Um, there are some sort of tropes that I think are bought into in here that, I mean, I, as someone who does identify as disabled, but not in the same way that this character does, 
I still recognized those tropes and I didn't feel super comfortable with them. And I suppose at the end of the day, this is centering her experience of learning about him, learning about his disability and sort of figuring out how she might be in a relationship with someone like him in his situation, like how that would affect their lives, whether that's what she wants, whether she's up to looking after him and taking care of him and helping him. And sometimes I think it's cool in that it does display her sort of trying to help him and him sort of putting up boundaries, being like, no, that's not what I need from you, please stop. So I guess what I'm saying is that it's messy and complicated and sometimes that really, really works. Um, and it really highlights the complexities of his life in I think a really genuine way, sort of showing that this is a big part of his life experience, but it's not the only thing that defines him. In other ways, I think this kind of stumbles. And I think, you know, centering a character who's not disabled in a story about disability, I understand that choice and I think especially as the author is not disabled herself, I don't know, it's just, it's one of those things that's tricky to get right and I think this comes pretty close and it does really, really try and I like a lot about that and I respect a lot about that but it fumbles sometimes, I guess. I think the other thing I'll say is that it did feel quite rushed to me and I wanted to sort of linger in some moments longer. And at the end, it does say that this was originally supposed to be a one shot and now the series has been extended due to the success of this story. So that sort of rushed feeling did make sense. Like this almost does feel like a one shot. And so I'm left a little bit confused about whether I want to continue. There is not enough representation of disability, especially like visible physical disabilities in manga or in many media. And I do appreciate how much effort and respect has been given to the topic in this manga. Both of the characters are really sweet and both of them are fully fleshed out characters, which I do appreciate. I did find and read a really good review of this actually, which I'll leave a link to in the description box below. So I did like it. I just don't know that I love it. Um, but perhaps that is in part because this was designed to be a one shot and it almost feels like it's wrapped up but I do want to spend more time with these characters. So I suppose we'll just, we'll just wait and see. Watakoi. This one is probably one of my most anticipated reads. I really thought I was going to love this with everything I've heard that this, you know, is featuring mid 20 age characters who are geeky and nerdy, but it's, you know, a total romance, like a modern day romance of two nerdy people. Like I'm here for that. On paper, it ticks all the boxes basically. Ah, and yet I am so disappointed. I, I almost DNF'd this. I basically ended up skim reading the last quarter of this. I did not like it. I did not like it at all. It wasn't anything like particularly egregious about it. Like I wasn't mad at it. I was just disappointed. Perhaps I just went in with expectations that were not realistic. Uh, this is definitely a comedy, not a romance as far as I'm concerned. Like the setup is basically that these two characters are otakus. They're both geeks, nerds, however you want to sort of translate it. They were really good friends in middle school. They end up sort of like getting back together in their mid twenties. And they just decide, you know, instead of trying to hide the fact that they're otakus, uh, why not just date each other? They're really good friends. They get along really well. They know each other quite well from back in the day. So why not play games together and be in a relationship? Cute setup. But beyond that initial setup, there is literally no romance. <laughs> like point to me the romance. Like every chapter just felt like a different skit with featuring them and their other two friends that are also otakus. And every skit was just about how nerdy and geeky they all are. And that, that's it. That's this whole 260 something pages is just a bunch of cheap gags about nerds being nerds. And I know some people love that sort of stuff because it's light, it's fun, it's funny. I just didn't really find it that funny personally. And I love slice of life stuff. I get that this is not supposed to be some big drama thing. And that's one of the reasons I was so excited about it. But even in slice of life, what I like so much about those stories is that they just take time with characters. And so we get to learn so much about characters and character dynamics and we get to see character growth happen in a really natural organic way. This didn't feel like that. This does not feel slice of life to me. It just feels like skits, like comedy skits in very mundane settings. And I suppose to me that there's a difference between those two things. And yes, I'm aware this is only the first two volumes, but to me, if I don't care at all about the relationship in a romance by the end of two volumes, like, 
I'm just not investing anymore, whether that be time or money. Like it's just, it's just not happening. Like clearly this is not for me. Like the humor is not for me. There's not enough romance. There's not enough character development. There's not enough like interest between them as individuals and them together. And I suppose I was thinking it would be a little bit more like Donuts Under a Crescent Moon. Like to me, this is a slice of life, more mature romance. And it is very, very slow burn. Like we have not had any actual romance going on, but there's still so much character development here already in this much shorter volume. And we're starting to see very small tender moments between those characters. I'm already interested in both of them and in their journey together. Whereas this just had a lot of jokes about him spending too much time playing games and also being obsessed with girls with big boobs and her being flat chested and not being very good at games, but being a little bit too invested in the manga she's reading. In fact, looking at this stack, I think it's my least favorite out of all of them that I read. And I would have pegged this to be a five star favorite, can't wait to pick the rest of the series up kind of read. So in this episode, we read nine. Did we, oh, I'm gonna drop them all. Ah! Yes, we read nine volumes in this episode. I think Watakoi was the only one I didn't like. And I think this would be about my ranking in terms of enjoyment. I mean, I do feel a bit bad putting Spy Family that close to Watakoi. I basically need like just a massive gap because I enjoyed all of these except for Watakoi. Boys Run Riot was absolutely my favorite volume that I read this video. It was incredible. Like, I just think this is such a strong first entry and such a strong setup. Donuts Under a Crescent Moon is certainly a slow burn, but already it's so tender. Uh, and so I find that quite charming. I'm already invested. Blue Flag definitely has that high school feeling, but the characters I think were fleshed out enough and distinct enough for me to enjoy them and feel like they were real people rather than just like cliche high school kids. And this love quadrangle is definitely intriguing. After the Rain, I really enjoyed this, even though it's controversial. I think the complexities and the nuances and those sort of like meandering in the gray area is what I found so compelling about this. I think this is either something I'll be mad at by the end or I will love by the end of the series. A Perfect World is very sweet, very real. It has its problems, but I think it's still valuable and worthwhile. Our son is gay, adorable, but a bit repetitive. A sign of affection, sweet, but very cliche. Spy Family I did actually really enjoy as a standalone. I just don't care about continuing reading it. I don't care about the characters and I'm much more of a character driven reader than I am a plot driven reader. So even though I probably enjoyed this volume more than I enjoyed these two, I think I'd probably be slightly more likely to pick up volume two of either of these series than I would Spy Family, if that makes sense. And then Watakoi, just an utter disappointment. There's no way for me to get around that. So in summary, I am not continuing with these four series. I'm on the fence about A Perfect World and I am continuing. In fact, I've already bought subsequent volumes for all four of these series. So pretty much a split right down the middle success rate. But I think that will do for this vlog. Thank you so much for watching. I would love to hear in the comments below if you've read any of these series, what you thought of them, or if there's any other series based on what I have and have not liked that you think I should check out that I might like. But that's it from me for now. So thank you for watching. I'll talk to you in the comments below and in the next video. Until then, happy reading and so much love. Bye.